Today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics. We're going to try to cram in quite a bit of material in one hour. I did this about two days ago as a full day seminar. So, if, but there's lots of resources available that I'll direct you to and uh, places where you can learn a lot more. What we're going to do is talk a little bit about what we actually mean, although I think most everyone here is well familiar with at least the general concept of animal boarding, talk about how widespread it is, a little bit of, about the types we see, who's involved, and as a psychologist primarily, uh, I am very interested in, in the underlying psychology, but then what do we do? What are the factors that lead to this? And then what's the best way to respond? That's where we've seen the most change in the last few years, shifting from a focus on treating this as a law enforcement uh, problem more to a mental health and community oriented problem. If you heard anything related to, okay, I'm still having problems with these, still have anything related to uh, animal hoarding in the past, you probably heard the term animal collectors or animal collecting. And we started now, probably about a decade ago, using the term animal hoarding because hoarding is something quite distinct from collecting. You know, there's a hoard of books, and there's a collection of books. Um, this is a hoarder, one of our hoarders in, in New York City. This is a hoarding situation uh, in, in the Bronx. There are a few cats mixed in there with all the bottles and other trash. The main difference between collecting and hoarding is if you have a collection of stuff, presumably it has some actual value, uh, <laughs> practical, historic, sentimental, psychological, but to hoarders in general, everything has some value. Every bottle cap has a unique bend, uh, so that, that, that adds a little bit of a, a wrinkle to this. Usually a collection is, is organized. The, we use the term hoarding these days because it is a medical term. It really describes something that has an intrinsic origin, a psychological origin, and what distinguishes it most is, is the impact on ADLs. That's a social work term for activities of daily living. If you've got a bunch of stuff, you're not necessarily a hoarder unless that collection of stuff is impeding your ability to live like a normal human being. Can you sleep in a bed? Can you cook in your kitchen? Can you make it to the door in the case of an emergency? And in the case of true hoarders, the answer is often no. Uh, so there's the impact on your social functioning, but also the impact on others. And from a veterinary perspective, we're usually talking about animal others, but often there are other people that are impacted by the presence of animal hoarding. Many of you probably have seen the kind of official definition of animal hoarding crafted by Dr. Gary Petronic and the Tufts Animal Hoarding of Animals Research Consortium. And uh, it's, it's worth going through uh, in some detail. First of all, it says someone who accumulates a large number of animals. Notice that we don't specify how many. We've had hoarding cases that might only have a dozen and hoarding cases that involve over a thousand. Uh, fails to provide minimal standards of nutrition, sanitation, and veterinary care. That's where we start getting into the basic definition of what makes this a hoarding case. The animals are not being properly cared for, either food, water, shelter, veterinary care. And then the, the final distinguishing characteristic is failing to act on the deteriorating condition of the animals, including disease, starvation, even death, and on the environment, uh, or the negative effect of the collection on their own health and well-being and that of other household members. And again, that's what for us, from a legal and intervention standpoint, characterizes having large numbers of animals as a hoarding situation. Not only are the animals not being properly cared for, but the person responsible for those animals doesn't get it. They literally do not perceive the problem or they deny that any problem exists. What animal hoarding is not usually is feral cat caretakers, although some uh, cat colony maintainers probably could be characterized as hoarders without walls, but generally that's, that's not the case because a, 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 uh, a true cat caretaking situation usually uh, does try to uh, provide adequate shelter, veterinary care, and so on. We're not talking about breeders or puppy mills. There can be some overlap, but one of the distinguishing characteristics 
of an animal hoarder is they feel that they are the only ones that can provide what these animals need. They have special knowledge, special skills, special relationship. So the animals are collected, but they are usually not placed. If you are selling animals, if you are offering animals for adoption, uh, it's less likely that this is a hoarding situation. Uh, we're not just talking about people that just have too many pets, uh, because again, we're basing this on the condition of the animals and some of the psychological motivation. Uh, we're not talking about menageries or exhibits, but again, we've had big cat hoarders. I, I worked on a whole documentary on lion and tiger hoarders. Um, and we're not talking about legitimate animal rescue groups, shelters, or sanctuaries. Uh, and we'll go into some detail on what distinguishes between a rescue hoarding situation and a true animal rescue. This is nothing new. Uh, as those of you who heard me speak uh, last night, I'm, I'm interested in going back through history, finding out relationships with things. This is uh, an, from a story in 1875 in the New York Sun, the story of Rosalia Goodman, uh, a crazy cat lady from more than 130 years ago, 140 years ago. And here's the description from 1875, which I think could be written in a report today uh, perhaps less floridly, but cats are perceptible on every hand. Cats with eyes, without eyes, earless, cats of every description skulk in the black nooks and rush out and disappear in sudden panic and all the time from sunrise to sunrise, an aromatic and voluminous cloud of feline <laughs> exhalation is rafted down the stairs into the street. If you've ever responded to a cat morning situation, you've experienced the uh, feline exhalation <laughs> wrapping down. So this is you know, 140 years old. So this is not new. Uh, that was from New York City. Here are some pictures I came across from the Chicago Historical Society. We've got one cat lady uh, in Chicago. Another one had a very interesting housing situation there for her cats built into the fence. Also, what, what is very interesting to me is this is not a uniquely American problem. Some people think, well, it's just all you, you loony Americans and your, your love of animals. Uh, I've done two hoarding response workshops for the Japanese Veterinary Medical so uh, Society. Uh, and this is a case of a mummified dog in a chair in a 1999 Japanese hoarding case. Uh, this is a picture of a mummified dog in a chair from a case in Tennessee that we responded to. We have seen animal hoarding cases literally from all over the world. Uh, and that to me is a very important indicator that there are some underlying biological factors. When you have something like schizophrenia or uh, other disease conditions that cut across cultures, it certainly suggests a biological component. The problem that we had until fairly recently is people just don't tend to take animal hoarding all that seriously, or at least didn't in the past. Uh, you know, you can, you can buy the crazy cat lady figurine. Uh, many people have uh, given this to me for, as Christmas presents. I've got a collection of crazy cat lady figurines. Uh, my favorite is the crazy cat lady game where you, the board game where you go around trying to collect as many cats as possible, all the while eluding animal control. <laughs> and for kids, there's the crazy cat lady coloring book, uh, and so on. But we start to recognize the seriousness of this problem, I think, with a lot of the media coverage, including you know, Animal Planet's uh, special series Confessions, Animal Hoarding, and probably if you're like me, you, you watched one or two and really can't watch them all because you live it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are fascinating to, to at, at least see the, the variety of situations. A, a good documentary uh, just called Cat Ladies, which really shows how, how articulate many animal hoarders are. Uh, these people are not stupid. They are crazy, but they're not stupid. Um, so, well, how widespread is this problem? As you, you know, uh, last, last year, or now two years ago, the uh, American Psychiatric Association added hoarding disorder as a recognized mental disorder to the statistical manual, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. 
and they estimate that hoarding disorder affects two to five percent of adults, of all adults in the, in the country. Uh, now, since we have pets in more than two-thirds of American homes, that means we potentially have over three million people in the U.S. with hoarding disorder who have access to pets. We actually estimate, based on a number of studies, about two to 3,000 new cases a year. Other estimate uh, give, give rise that up to about 5,000 cases a year. And I think somewhere between two and 5,000 cases a year is, is probably accurate for the number of new hoarding cases. Whenever I do an animal care and control conference, I usually ask uh, you know, how many agencies are currently working at least one hoarding case. Every hand goes up. And based on that, I'd also come up with an estimate of about uh, two to 3,000 new cases each year. Um, we've seen cases ranging from you know, 20 animals to, to over 2,000. So on average, probably the hoarding cases we see, somewhere around you know, 50 animals, so at minimum, we are seeing at least a quarter of a million animals being subjected to the problems of animal hoarding uh, each year. And obviously the severity, uh, it, this is a very severe problem in terms of the numbers of animals, the degree of suffering. You know, if, if you compare the, uh, the harm done to animals in terms of intentional cruelty, your average intentional animal abuse case of a dog or cat that's been beaten, burned, stabbed, whatever, our typical uh, intentional abuse case involves one or two animals, you, most of which die, but die relatively quickly. Our typical animal hoarder case involves at, at least 50 animals, and sometimes many, many more, who will often suffer for a long period of time. And as you'll see later, most of, or the majority of our perpetrators in animal hoarding cases are females, generally older females. So, in terms of the amount of animal suffering perpetrated, animal hoarders are a much more serious concern than the violent animal cruelty offenders. They are obviously of enormous concern to us because of the high likelihood that they are involved in other, uh, other potential acts of, of cruelty. Um, and animal hoarding is incredibly costly to communities. If you're a small shelter, you've got an animal hoarding case, you gotta take in 150 cats, that seriously impacts your ability to serve the community. If you're taking in 50 dogs, that fills every cage, and you might have to hold them for weeks or months. Uh, even 15 years ago, when we first started looking at prosecuted animal hoarding cases, the average cost was about $10,000. Uh, probably we're, we're you know, at least 10 times that now uh, in terms of cost. When ASPCA responds to the large scale cases, which we often do, it's not unusual for us to uh, have costs in excess of a million dollars in res responding to a large scale hoarding. So they're, they're very costly. There's a lot of human and iron environmental impact. Uh, you basically, you know, if, if you've had a, a, a cat hoarding house, that, that house, it's almost impossible to ever clean that house. Often they're, they're torn down, bulldozed, burned to the ground, whatever. Uh, and certainly there are long-term health issues for the individuals involved and for the animals involved. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, this was actually the first animal hoarding case that, that I w was actively involved in around here in Ellenville, New York, Animals Farm Home. Probably most of you are too young to have been involved in that or know about that. Justin McCarthy uh, ran an operation called Animals Farm Home he was written up in the Reader's Digest as Dr. Doolittle of the Catskills. Uh, and he had a nice reception area. People would drop off their dogs, and then this is where they went. Uh, we recovered with the work of the help of about 12 agencies throughout New York State. Uh, we recovered over 1,000 dogs from this facility, um, many of whom were, were uh, rehomed. Uh, quite a few actually got back to their original owners who had surrendered them. Justin McCarthy's still around. He's moved to my state of Virginia, but he's under constant monitoring and surveillance and fortunately has not been able to start up again. Uh, he was prosecuted primarily for fraud. He was basically taking big donations to care for animals he never cared for uh, and did face some pretty serious, I don't think he ever did any, any uh, jail time, but serious consequences. So this was my introduction to animal hoarding. Uh, and it also, very early on, 
demonstrated to us the need to really work together with as many groups as mm -hmm. possible because you can't handle that and you can't do it alone just as uh, veterinarians or animal care and control agencies. The other important message is these are uh, hazmat situations. Again, the days of going into a hoarder house with your sneakers and a painter's mask and a little Vaseline, you know, they're long gone. As a matter of fact, the uh, day before yesterday, I went through a uh, training session uh, on, on um, ha hazmat situations and particularly bloodborne pathogens. And there they basically advised, Tyvek not enough for a hoarding case. You need blue suit, you need the next layer of protection. In some cases you need the yellow suit, which is the next layer above that. Uh, so we, we can provide more, more potential information uh, on, on hazmat type adjustments. Uh, but these, these clearly are, and you certainly need respirators. Uh, the, the typical respirators you might, might recover, uh, you might use, will give you maybe 25 to 40 minutes uh, in, in uh, a hoarder home, and you need to change out the filters. Uh, so there certainly are, are a variety of potential issues there. Just a couple of, I mean, you, you see a few cats there. You, you all know what hoarding situations look like. Now, typically, we do see object hoarding in connection with um, animal hoarding. Here, this person happened to have a large collection of junk and computer monitors and stuff, but you'll see cats perched throughout that. Uh, so who hoards? As we mentioned, the majority are women. That also would tend to suggest uh, a possible biological component to this. We know in general anxiety disorders are a little bit more common in women than men. The majority are unmarried and have never been married. However, we have couples, gay and straight. We have young men who are hoarders. We have young women who are hoarders. And the other issue is, is uh, often our animal hoarders are well-educated. Uh, they are most commonly associated with helping professions, nurses, teachers, vet techs, veterinarians. Uh, I've been involved in at least four prosecutions of veterinarians for animal hoarding. Uh, so high levels of education, generally high levels of income or higher levels, uh, at least initially, but hoarding tends to dissipate their financial resources. This is from a, a study that, that Gary Petronic and Colin Berry and I did looking at prosecuted animal hoarding cases. And uh, what you see is, yes, we've, we've got all over the map, but the majority of the cases that went into court were women between 50 and 59. And that pretty much reflects the demographic. So, you know, the, the, the stereotype of the crazy cat lady, it's, it's not completely a stereotype. It has some, some ring of truth, but certainly we've seen every other possible combination. And the majority of animals that are hoarded are dogs and cats, but if you can acquire it, you can hoard it. We have seen rat hoarders, tarantula hoarders, parrot hoarders, horse hoarders, beaver hoarders, uh, pretty much anything, but the majority of cases are dogs and cats. Most hoarders tend to specialize in one species, but we do have cases where they have a little bit of everything. Uh, so again, there are no absolute characteristics. Hoarders, this is their entire life. Uh, we, we talk about the concept of self-psychology. How do you define yourself? Well, you probably define yourselves partly you know, through your job, through your involvement in veterinary medicine, you're caring for animals and all that. That's what defines you. That's how you think of yourself as a good human being. I help animals, I help people, and so on. Hoarders work the same way. Uh, hoarders define themselves around their animals. Most of their time, most of their money, and most of their contacts are involved with their interaction with animals. Well, that goes for everyone in this room as well. So, um, but that actually gives us a common ground. When dealing with hoarder, again, you can't go in as the, you know, the, the jack-booted law enforcement officer saying, this is not right, we're taking all your animals away. What I suggest is we start with that common ground they love in some perverse way. They love their animals or certainly profess to. You love animals. That gives you common ground that, that enables you to 
uh, form some beginning of an understanding of a basis of working with them. Um, often there are enablers. Most of the tips we get about boarding situations come from relatives, often you know, children or, or uh, uh, your brothers and sisters, uh, or from volunteers, if it's a rescue hoarding situation, I thought I was there to help these cats, these cats are suffering, you gotta come help us. Uh, but um, sometimes there, there are enablers in the form of staff and volunteers. We've had a problem in the past uh, of, of public officials basically feeding animals to hoarders, that in the interest of, of maintaining uh, you know, a, a no-kill presence that a lot of municipal shelters have been only too willing to pass animals on to uh, a so-called rescue group without ever checking out where they're going. We had a major case in, in <coughs> Delaware of uh, a, a fairly serious uh, dog hoarding situation, but turns out that shelters from all over the Northeast were actually sending animals to this person, and no one had ever been to her shelter to check it out. If you are involved in a shelter and you are giving unadoptable animals to a, quote, rescue group, um, if you have not visited the facilities of their rescue group, that's irresponsible. And also recognize that things can go downhill pretty quickly. Uh, you need to be doing those inspections on a pretty regular basis. So that's one piece of warning. Obviously, uh, what just characterizes a true hoarding situation is the neglect, the environmental neglect of personal health and hygiene. You often, if, if you're working in a clinic and you have uh, a hoarder who is bringing some, and usually they don't bring many uh, animals to your, your facility, uh, you know it. You, know, you can smell the cat ladies, uh, although they clean up real nice in court. There certainly is, is neglect of, of animal health and hygiene. Often they do have debris, at least at least probably a third to a half of animal hoarders hoard other stuff, uh, and general decay and disrepair. A, a lot of the complaints, uh, when I did the workshop a couple of days ago, uh, a lot of the complaints are coming in from, let's say, visiting nurses and visiting healthcare people. Is, I can't get in the front door. Uh, it's another reason why we need to also involve uh, you know, fire, housing authorities, and others who can deal with conditions, physical conditions. Now, one of the characteristics of hoarding disorder is also certain elements of paranoia. Uh, you are their worst enemy uh, if you're with animal control because they just see you as someone who wants to take all their animals away and euthanize them, which kind of becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy because the conditions deteriorate so much that that's probably the most humane thing to do. But also they, they feel there's also an element of narcissism. So you've got paranoia, narcissism, and hearting disorder, uh, because you don't know squat. Uh, they, most hoarders feel veterinarians are stupid. They know more about what these animals need uh, than you do. And they have their own special unique diets, which are usually pretty awful. Uh, one guy basically was mixing bread and corn and you know, occasional chicken stock. Uh, we had one hoarder who, she had a lot of inbred dogs with, uh, uh, with seizure disorders, and her cure for that was uh, throwing them in a mud puddle, and she claimed that that, that helped with their, of course the seizures would pass, and therefore, oh, well that must have worked, until next time. Um, usually their assi assistance from outside groups uh, is rejected, but even if it's accepted, are you, if, if you're bringing food to them, are you basically an enabler uh, if you're not really getting at the root of the problem? Another thing that characterizes animal hoarding is denial or alibis for behavior. Serious health problems are, are minimized. Um, environmental problems are minimized. One of my favorite, we have a video we don't have time to show, of uh, a dog hoarder from, from Houston who had 59 dogs in, in a house about the size of this room. She had dead dogs on the floor. The reporter is showing her the crime scene photographs showing dead animals, and she's looking at the picture and says, quote, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just a little dirty. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just a little dirty. She repeats that several times. 
Now there's some suggestion, you know, and that's the question I get asked a lot. Can't they <coughs> smell what's going on or are their mucous membranes destroyed? Can't they see there's a dead animal in their bed or on their kitchen table? And the suggestion is at some level, no. There do seem to be disorders, uh, brain disorders in the processing of sensory information, at least in, in, in some horrors there's evidence of that. Dead animals are often ignored. Short-term excuses for long-term problems, and they certainly do define themselves as rescuers. The fact that that animal is alive, even if it's immobile, covered in sores, open wounds, uh, unable to stand, crammed in a little cage, it's alive, and that to them is the most important thing. And uh, probably what I have to testify about most in court at, at sentencing uh, is, the, is the reality that without supervision, treatment, and so on, virtually all hoarders, particularly animal hoarders, resume their activities without ties to the community they leave, so lifelong monitoring is essential. For object hoarding in general, there are treatment protocols of cognitive behavioral therapy, some medication to deal with the anxiety components, but even with treatment, hoarding disorder has a recidivism rate probably at least 70%. Without treatment, and in cases of animal hoarding, uh, they usually don't show up for treatment uh, or skip town, probably the recidivism rate is virtually 100%. Uh, and we've been tracking some animal hoarders for decades now. So where does this come from? Well, here's my favorite Simpsons character, the crazy cat lady. And she, uh, if, you, if you ever watch the origin story on the Simpsons of the crazy cat lady, it's actually quite accurate. She got her MD from Yale and her, PH, and her law degree from Harvard. And, uh, but that, the, 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 the stress of being both a lawyer and a doctor gets to be a bit much, so she gets Buster and starts having a little drink each night with Buster. And Buster gives her some comfort and solace and, and uh, unconditional positive regard. So she thinks she'll get another one, and another one, and another one, and then she becomes the crazy cat lady. Uh, so it's relatively easy if you have that fertile groundwork, it's easy to become, uh, you know, there, there, there's an abundance of crazy cat lady starter kits out there. As I mentioned, it is now in the DSM, Hoarding Disorder. Uh, and because uh, hoarding is prevalent and can have direct and indirect consequences on the health and safety of patients as well as that of others. Now, animal hoarding is only one sentence in the three-page definition of hoarding disorder. And they open the possibility that animal hoarding may actually be a separate disorder or a different disorder. And certainly you can see why that may be true, that you don't get the same attachment to those 27 toasters you've got on QVC that you might have to the dogs and cats in your care. Uh, the big difference between uh, animal hoarding and object hoarding is animals pee, poop, and die and, and reproduce, uh, but also they respond to you. They give you the illusion or the reality of affection and response, and they affirm that self-image you have. So in that sense, I think animal hoarding is much more addictive, potentially, than object hoarding, because you get feedback that reinforces all those psychological needs of why you need to be surrounded by stuff. Well, I got a lot of, after uh, the DSM came out, I got a lot of inquiries saying, oh, geez, does this mean that we can't uh, prosecute animal hoarders or we can't investigate animal hoarders because they're mentally ill officially? And the reality is no. Mental illness is not a get out of jail free card. You are still responsible for your actions. However, um, we've had this at a couple of workshops recently. If you have someone in public housing or something like that, uh, hoarding disorder could be considered a disability. If you are living in public housing and have a disability, you basically can't be Know, evicted solely on the basis of that, you have to be offered some kind of accommodation. That doesn't mean we need to tolerate you living in an apartment with three feet of cat feces in it. What that accommodation legally probably means is we have to give you a little bit more time, a little bit more resources, a little bit more assistance in cleaning up your act. It doesn't mean we have to let you 
continue to create situations that are basically uh, illegal. <coughs> now, many hoarders do have serious mental health issues, uh, but usually that doesn't mean they can't be held legally responsible for their actions. Uh, I've only had a handful of cases where animal hoarders were considered unfit to stand trial due to mental disabilities, and usually those in involved cases of either dementia or schizophrenia, uh, in which case that was relatively easy, though, to get the animals out of their care. We used to just kind of think of hoarding disorder or, or animal hoarding as a, a, a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, but it is quite different uh, and much more complex. Again, this is from uh, Petronic and Jay Nathanson, a clinical social worker. Uh, it sort of sets the complex pathway whereby hoarding might originate. We do think that there is probably a genetic predisposition. Paper just came out a couple of weeks ago looking at twin studies, and there's a fairly high heritability of, of uh, hoarding, that, but the, the genetic influence seems to decrease with age, but what that means is other stuff in your life becomes more important in determining whether or not um, you might become a hoarder. Most of our hoarders, or many of our hoarders, have very disrupted childhood experiences, often abusive, either physically or sexually, uh, abusive parenting, or absent parenting, or parents who were alcoholic or drug addicted. So you've got fertile groundwork for attachment disorders. They can't form strong connections to other people. Uh, there might be other genetic fe or fetal factors. So you've got basically emotional instability, disordered attachment, and your human attachments are pretty weak. You're not very competent in making friends, find, finding partners, or whatever. Animals kind of fill that void. Uh, anybody can get a cat, anybody can pick up a dog, uh, but human, it, it's no substitute for human attachments, so you need more and more and more. And it also, helps you define yourself. Then there are often triggers. Many of our animal hoarders become serious hoarders following some traumatic incident, usually death of a parent, sibling, child, something like that. I was involved in one case of a, a woman whose son was killed in a boating accident. Her psychiatrist think, suggested she get over her grief by getting a puppy. So she got a lots of opso. And it helped a little, but so she got another one and another one. And finally had 109 Lhasa Opsos. Uh, and finally we, you know, we, we did prosecute her and got her the kind of help she really did need. And she was wealthy enough to build a shelter nicer than the local shelter to uh, facility to care for. The, she got her dogs back because she started taking good care of them and was in uh, care. I wouldn't call her recovered, but as a hoarding situation, it was under control. Um, so, so we've talked about genetic uh, predisposition, talked about possible neurological disorder. Probably, uh, you, you might have seen, there's a lot of coverage, it comes up every couple of months, you know, an article along the lines of, are cats making us crazy? There's a lot of literature out there uh, that purports to suggest a relationship between toxoplasmosis and various psychological disorders, including schizophrenia and hoarding disorder. Um, mostly they have been debunked. But part of the problem might be that whatever it, 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 uh, effect toxoplasmic uh, infection may have, it might you know, be one of those contributing factors that lays the groundwork. But certainly, uh, and of course that's being used to explain crazy cat ladies, but we have probably most of the hoarders we've seen in the last two years are bunny hoarders. And that's not a factor in bunny hoarding, uh, or, or iguana hoarding, or goat hoarding. We have all of those. So uh, if you're interested, you, know, you can email me and get you the literature basically debunking that. But you, I, about every three months, it seems to pop up again. It was actually a Time Magazine story, Are Our Cats Making Us Crazy? And really, there is, there's no there there. Uh, there does not seem to be strong indication that's true. But also, I think part of it is the societal support. The fact that, that as a society, we've become much more sensitive to uh, euthanasia, certainly euthanasia not, not to control uh, pain and suffering, but euthanasia as population control. And so 
you know, certainly to the rescue hoarders, the concept of, of euthanasia is totally abhorrent, even for animals that might be, be suffering. Uh, many of the, we, we have different levels, different degrees. Most of the situations that we get involved with in New York are what we would call overwhelmed caregivers. They're not yet true hoarding situation because uh, the conditions haven't deteriorated that badly. Uh, and the hoarder is not in denial. They just, they, they know they need some help. And those are the situations we like. Then we get the exploiter hoarders. That's the Justin McCarthy's of the world. They are, they have some psychological need and power and control of carrying these animals in, but basically they're ripping people off. Getting money for caring for animals they don't care for. We do have, I don't see many breeder hoarders, but you can have some overlap. But again, usually they don't want anything to go. And probably our biggest problem in terms of the numbers of animals and most all of our large-scale hoarding cases are rescue hoarders. Uh, and rescue hoarders basically have you know, th th this mission to save as many animals as they possibly can. And fear of death, uh, they oppose euthanasia. Animals are acquired actively, sometimes surreptitiously. Uh, these are some of the people that, that you know, if they think an animal's not being properly cared for, they'll break into your yard and steal it. Uh, they believe you have a unique ability to care, and the animals go in, they don't go out. Uh, they, they avoid the authorities. You know, you, you know you're dealing with a hoarding situation. If At some level, they know what they're doing is not uh, normal, so these are the homes that have uh, the aluminum foil over the windows, things like that and they are very evasive and very litigious. A lot of veterinarians ask me, if I get involved in an animal cruelty case, uh, am I gonna get sued by the person I testified against? Uh, and typically in your animal abuse case, that's not gonna happen. Most animal abusers are basically bullies and cowards. However, the crazy cat ladies are incredibly litigious. They don't win, they never win, or at least in my experience, but they can be a real pain in terms, because they feel what they're doing is right. You're the crazy one. You want to euthanize animals. You enjoy euthanizing animals in their view. Uh, so uh, they're the ones that, that may in fact sue you, but not successfully. They uh, often also have a network of enablers. If you've ever been to a trial or a hearing involving an animal hoarder, you'll see there's usually the front row has a bunch of other animal hoarders taking notes. <laughs> and they, they you know, they, they, they share information. So if, if a particular defense seems to work, uh, they rapidly start sharing that. So uh, I think this is a useful thing to help you distinguish between, am I dealing with a, with a hoarder or am I dealing with a legitimate rescue group? Particularly when people are coming to you or to a shelter saying, let me have the animals that you can adopt or let me have the animals that you may euthanize. A true rescue group knows what they have. Animal hoarders are very disorganized for the most part. They keep little or no records, and they don't know what they have. An individual hoarder, if you go into a, a hoarder home and you ask how many cats do you have, you should say, uh, 15. And you're standing there counting 31, 32, 33, 34. So they don't have good numbers. Rescue hoarders are usually overwhelmed, and they don't even know what they have. They don't have records. Uh, so they'll often say, if you have an animal with, with open bleeding wounds or uh, untreated medical conditions, they'll often say, oh, I just got him yesterday. He just came in that way. And that becomes a forensic issue of being able to document that that animal's been there for a while. Or you might need testimony from staff or from volunteers saying, no, that cat's been here for six months. That happens quite often. Uh, legitimate rescue group, uh, you know, legitimate no-kill shelter knows their limits. I'm sorry, we can't take in any more now. We're full, but we've adopted out some animals and have some room. We we'll hopefully can get back to you. Basically, for a rescue hoarder, they don't care. They'll just pack them in. If they have to put a whole bunch of animals in one crate or one cage, they'll do it. Sometimes they'll mix sexes, so that just creates more problems. Um, any legitimate rescue group is always seeking to find lifelong loving homes for the animals in their care. Uh, the rescue hoarder, my favorite quote from a rescue hoarder, uh, when asked, uh, you know, how many animals do you, do you place? And her response was, I wouldn't give one of my dogs to Jesus Christ if he came in the door. <laughs> 
that, that is the level of, of both paranoia and narcissism. They're the only ones that can provide care. So they usually avoid placement. Now, the exotic hoarders sometimes have to give up some of their animals to make money to feed the other animals. So if you have animals that are expensive to care for, you might see some placement, but usually not. Obviously, a legitimate rescue group is going to spay neuter animals or at least maintain them in ways to prevent breeding. Uh, sometimes we have accidental or even intentional breeding by the hoarders. Uh, again, one of my, my favorite cases was a lady who claimed that we just wanted to seize her, her dogs because she was breeding a rare breed of hairless German shepherds, and they were going to be really valuable. And of course, those hairless German shepherds miraculously, when treated with ivermectin, uh, <laughs> develop hair. Uh, but you know, so, so they often are breeding animals because they think they have some unique value. Usually rescue groups have diverse sources of income. Uh, often they are 501c3s. Some of our rescue hoarders all have their nonprofit status as well. You need to follow the money, but uh, they, they, or they might exploit you know, one or two people who are kind of angels. Usually rescue groups have adequate and stable staff. They might have a veterinarian on staff or at least under contract. Uh, rescue hoarders, usually it's themselves, maybe a spouse, a kid, volunteers who come and go. Uh, and it's never enough. And they usually have, if they're providing any uh, veterinary care, it's usually going to be emergency care, uh, usually like a urinary obstruction or something like that. Uh, most of the people running legitimate rescue groups don't have any criminal history. Our rescue hoarders often do. Well, I've only been shot at once by a hoarder. So. Uh, you're all familiar with the five freedoms, again, this is a chart from, from Gary Petronic, how the five freedoms might apply to hoarding situations. We have you know, across the top the, the characteristic freedoms, and when they are all being met, that's competent caregiving. Down here, when nothing is being met, when there is no freedom from hunger, thirst, pain, injury, disease, distress, or whatever, that's what we as animal care professionals are usually comfortable describing as a life not worth living. And that's what distinguishes animal welfare professionals, I think, from hoarders. There is no such thing to an animal hoarder as a life not worth living. You can have that cat with a broken spine, convulsing, lying in its own feces in a tiny cage, and that's okay. It's alive. And that's not okay for most of us. I hope that's not okay for anybody in this room. And that's when we might see cruelty being prosecuted. I think all of you are aware of the Shelter Veterinary Guidelines for Standards of Care. We've used this in court uh, in animal hoarding cases or in uh, rescue hoarding cases to say there are professional standards for what you should be providing uh, when sheltering animals. Uh, we talked about the excuses and lies that you'll hear from animal hoarders. My handyman's been out sick. I hurt my back and can't lift this, the, the sacks of food, or they came in this way. Also, uh, we, we've heard a, a lot of hoarders now are describing themselves, well, this is a hospice. Yes, the reason why there are animals that are dying here is I'm, I'm, I'm an animal hospice. Well, there, as you well know, there are legitimate guidelines for uh, animal hospice situations, and they are, uh, again, focusing on palliative care and, and sanitary care and so on. Uh, the, uh, Colorado State has some very good guidelines on animal hospice care. So again, that's something you may need to refute in court. This is, having, a, having a, a, a sick animal lying in its own feces in a tiny cage is not a hospice. Um, so what do we do? Well, with the exploiter hoarder, uh, you gotta sue them. You gotta take them to court. Uh, they're unlikely to be intimidated by legal action. They are criminals. They lie, cheat, steal. The rescue hoarders, depending on where on the continuum they might be, you might be able to negotiate uh, a scaled down operation and monitor that. You might not need to prosecute for animal cruelty, but it may be necessary if uh, threats or efforts to reduce this fail. The overwhelmed caregiver, which is most of the cases that we deal with in New York City, we currently track about 125 hoarding cases at any given time in New York, 
and they're usually receptive to come in, let us uh, treat the animals that need some treatment, let us perhaps take the animals that are too sick to survive, let us neuter animals, let us return some animals to you, uh, and that might be enough, but you still are going to need um, supervision, but in that case, legal action uh, is often counterproductive and is a last resort. But with the rescue hoarders, as I say, they're usually articulate, media savvy, and they are quite litigious. I, not would, have not yet been sued, although I've worked on a couple of cases where everybody else involved, from the veterinarians to the prosecutor, was sued. No, none of them successfully. Uh, because they think they're in the right. Uh, part of our problem, and I do a lot of outreach to social services in the past, they've not really seen them as meeting the definition of being a threat to themselves or others. But about a quarter of the animal hoarding cases do involve the presence of either children or dependent adults, uh, either mom is, is living under the same conditions as the cats, or there are children present. So social services is beginning to, to get it. Um, Prosecutors often won't move forward unless there's actual evidence of cruelty. And judges are tend to be insensitive. You know, well, she's a sweet old lady. Why are you being so mean to the sweet old lady? She loves her cats. Well, that's not how we would define love. Uh, the large scale cases are complex cases. You can't just go in with two or three people and try to take the animals out. This is, this is one of our typical response teams. This was, some of you may have been familiar with Elk County uh, Cat Sanctuary. I think there were over 250 cats in that case. And this is the team we had to assemble. And we have you know, our direct response van, we've got a crime scene van, and a large team including veterinarians, vet techs, uh, crime scene uh, specialists, and, and uh, animal handling specialists, and so on. So, um, as mentioned, these are hazmat situations. If you don't have this material, uh, don't have appropriate PPE, certainly you should be looking into that if you're uh, in an organization. Um, you want to document the conditions. There are various hoarding scales available uh, on the Tufts website, other forms, body condition score uh, forms. Go to our ASPCA Pro site for a lot of other sample forms from Dr. Reisman and, and, and others. Uh, you know, this is how we document scars, injuries, and so on. Uh, and it's important th th that y your, your documentation of every animal really is going to form the basis of, of that case. And uh, often if there are hundreds or thousands of animals, uh, it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, we can talk about all the essential assessments. Often they will have medication present, but it's unopened. They will have food present, but it's not appropriate or it's been unopened. So document what's out there. Um, even you know, if, if a lot of these times animals are kept in crates, take a picture of the animal in its crate, then take the animal out of the crate, photograph the crate, let us know how much crap is in the crate. These all become important. Document the presence of drugs, but also uh, then, then note whether or not they've actually often been, been there. Uh, also, the, the documentation of unused drugs shows willful failure to provide what they know this animal needs. Another issue that I often get asked about is, uh, well, they don't tell you about the good dogs they took out. And you will probably find healthy animals. Uh, and that is good news to me because it shows this person knows what it takes to keep an animal healthy. And they have made the conscious decision to deny that care to all these other animals that have suffered. It doesn't hurt you to have healthy animals present. Um, what we want to know is, what do, you want to, what do you want to get out of it? I always try to work backwards. How do I want this to end? Well, I want this to end by first getting the people at risk out of the situation. Get grandma out. Get grandma into a nursing home. Get the children into protective care. And get the animals out. And get some agreement to limit the number of animals get long-term psychiatric assistant and assistance and counseling, usually at their expense. Part of the problem is it takes a long time to even do reasonably adequate treatment for hoarding disorder. Uh, Medicaid will only pay for, I think, 12 treatments, and that's not enough. So we really haven't seen good outcome there. So you need constant monitoring. Um, the disadvantage is, is 
if you do go to court, basically you're, you're potentially criminalizing a mental disorder. We have two states that do specifically have laws against defining the crime of animal hoarding, Illinois and Hawaii. Uh, Massachusetts had a bill, New Jersey had a bill, I think Florida had a bill pending, and uh, the Tufts Consortium, ASPCA, we are opposed to animal hoarding laws. You don't need them. Uh, that if it truly is a situation that requires legal intervention, existing anti-cruelty laws are sufficient. And by taking Tufts' definition of a mental disorder and saying, okay, now this is illegal, is really not an appropriate approach in, in our view. And might not be the best way to involve the community. So what you really need to do is specify how many animals, and we do recommend, I personally recommend, allowing them to have some animals uh, because it gives you a reason to have to go back or be allowed to go back, and, but specify in great detail. Obviously, we're concerned about what impact this has on the animals. We're just starting to collect that information. One of the things that we focus on at our uh, uh, rescue and rehab facility and the new facility that will open at the end of the year, hopefully in North Carolina, we do assessment and most of the animals that we, the dogs that we work with there are coming out of either puppy mill or hoarding situations. Uh, so we try to assess what skills they have do behavioral evaluation, and then begin working with them on getting them used to living real life. And right now, we're only planning on working with dogs, not cats, and work on basic life skills and sociability. And if you haven't seen uh, the special on our rescue and rehab work, it's on Netflix, so watch it. Uh, so two terms from social work that we make use of, uh, harm reduction and relapse prevention. Harm reduction is like when you have clean needle programs. You're not gonna end addiction, so at least you can try to prevent the spread of uh, AIDS and hepatitis and things like that by having a clean needle program. Right now, we can't cure animal hoarding, but we can reduce the harm by monitoring the situation, reducing the populations, meeting the human and animal needs, and by constant monitoring, preventing relapse prevention. And you can't do that alone. Animal control can't do that. Uh, veterinarians can't do it. Everybody's got to work together for the common goal. Uh, so let's, basically what a animal hoarding task force will do is evaluate risks, develop case plans, coordinate implementations of plans, and continue long-term monitoring. And these provisions need to be in place, uh, hopefully before the cases crop up. And all these different groups need to be involved, law enforcement, animal sheltering, veterinarians, housing, fire, social services, mental health. And this is a trend. Most counties or states now have hoarding task forces to deal with this. And quite a few of them include animal care and control or humane societies uh, in those task forces. These are ones that, that I know of personally that I've worked with. We have animal hoarding task forces. Uh, in my own area of Fairfax and Alexandria, and I work in Baltimore, but we have quite a few. If you know of others or if you're involved in one, let us know. But uh, if you don't have an animal hoarding task force, it would be advisable, particularly if you're working with a shelter, to find out if your municipality, your county, your city, or whatever has an existing hoarding task force and get yourself invited because uh, there's more and more recognition. So this is my county. Uh, Fairfax County, they do an annual report on hoarding cases. Um, what we do in New York City is we don't do this alone. These are all the groups that ASPCA works with on animal hoarding cases in New York, including Salvation Army, dealing with housing issues, dealing with homeless issues. Hoarding is a uh, almost guaranteed pathway to homelessness for people living in uh, city environments, so we deal with human resources. Uh, and a, a variety of social services. We have several social workers on staff, and we have what we call our Cruelty Intervention Advocacy Program, where we try to prevent these from becoming animal cruelty cases and deal with both the human and animal needs. And basically, since we're not dealing with stupid people, we're dealing with people with mental disorder, 
we can hold them to a contract of what needs to change. You need to be very specific about what in their life needs to change for them and their animals and what will happen if it doesn't. So we talk about improved conditions of the home, spaying and neutering, uh, sheltering, surrender and rehoming, ha emergency medical care, grooming, wellness, and so on. And basically, we, have, we sit down with them and say, here's what needs to change. You have to sign off on this, and we'll help you. We'll, we'll do the spay and neuter. We'll provide health care. Uh, we'll help with rehoming. And we'll visit you. And social service will visit you. And housing authority will visit you. And that really is the only way you can address these. So there are some good resources out there. Uh, best is just go to the Tufts Hoarding of Animals Research Consortium website. Uh, everything you want to know about hoarding pretty much is there. All kinds of good resources. Uh, a lot of good stuff all for free. Uh, a lot of my writings on this are on there. Or, of course, ASPCA, ASPCA Pro. Plenty of good information on hoarding resources. Uh, on the uh, Tufts website, uh, this is 10 years old, but it's still very good. A resource on community responsible hoarding that Carrie Petronic, Jane Davidson, and Lynn Lohr produced. Really good stuff on how to deal with, with that. Uh, another book I wrote with Phil Arco on starting coalitions in your community. Uh, again, how to, how to get people together, how to meet, how to set your goals. Uh, also, we have from you know, the, the shelter vet guidelines and ABMA's guidelines on suspected animal cruelty, abuse, and neglect. Uh, they're either available uh, from ABMA or most easily found at our website, the National Link Coalition.org. Uh, also, I'll be revising this soon, but we have a new guide uh, or a guide for prosecutors that mainly deals with the role of the veterinarian in building cases, particularly cruelty uh, and, and hoarding cases. And of course, our shelter medicine web pages on ASPCA Pro. Again, a lot of the resources and forms and documentation are available there. Uh, and there's chapter, I think, by, by Petronic in uh, Lila and Steve Z's uh, book. Uh, and the new book just came out uh, last week, uh, which has a new chapter on updated on everything we know about hoarding, written by Arnie Arluk and Gary Petronic and myself. So that will be out shortly. And that's how you can reach me. Okay, and I think I'm right on time. Thank you very much.